I am not going to show any slides, uh, um, graphs, pictures, or anything. I simply want to talk to you all very directly about this subject. Uh, and I'll start with the uh, start with the basics. Everything comes from somewhere, and dangerous new viruses that get into humans that cause new infectious diseases in humans come from wild animals. We know that. Why is that and why do we know it? It's because viruses can only replicate in cellular creatures, animals, plants, fungi, bacteria. Viruses themselves are not cells. Uh, viruses are just packets of uh, genetic material, DNA or RNA wrapped in a protein that are genetic parasites and they insert their genomes into cells of, of more complex creatures and use those the machinery of those cells to replicate. So viruses are dependent on other life forms, cellular life forms, animals, plants, fungi, et cetera. And those viruses that have the capability of replicating in human cells, passing from one human cell to another, building up their numbers and then passing from one human to another, those viruses come from animals because we are animals. Most of those viruses, in fact, come from birds and mammals. We are mammals and uh, our cells and the receptors on our cells are more similar to those of other mammals. Now we live in a world of viruses. Viruses are not these strange, sinister things that exist to make humans sick. Viruses are the largest repository of genetic information on the planet, the oceans, are filled with viruses simply infecting ocean bacteria. Um, the rich ecosystems on land that are filled with animals, plants, great diversity of creatures, all of those creatures are filled with viruses, unique viruses, creature species by species. Nobody knows exactly how many viruses reside in uh, other biological diversity on planet Earth, but there have been some educated uh, guesses, estimates that have been made. One of those is that there are 1.7 million viruses just in birds and mammals. And of those, it's estimated again that somewhere around 700,000 of those different kinds of viruses might have the potential to infect humans. So this is the world we live in. There is this constant um, situation where a new virus could become a human virus from having been an animal virus. How does that happen? It happens by contact, humans with non-human animals, and particularly disruptive contact. So when we go into wild ecosystems and uh, come in contact with the, the animals that are living there, we expose ourselves to the possibility of new viruses getting into, getting into us. I'm going to um, walk us through this subject uh, by essentially by defining five words and telling three stories. And once I've defined the five words and told the three stories, we'll try and figure out what that has to do with um, uh, our current situation and the future of life, including human life on planet Earth, simply that simply that. Um, the first of these words is zoonosis. Zoonosis. Now, a zoonosis is an animal infection that's transmissible to humans. Could be a virus, could be a, an infectious bacterium, could be a fungus, could be a worm, could be a prion, any sort of infectious pathogen. If that infectious pathogen passes from a non-human animal into a human, we call that a zoonosis. And if it causes disease in the human, we call that a zoonotic disease. This is not a minor fringe obscure subject at the edge of human medicine. This is central. And we all, we all have learned in the last year how central this is. When I was talking about this in my book Spillover back in 2012, I had to pers persuade people with, uh, that, um, that this subject, zoonotic diseases, was important was central. 70% roughly of human infectious diseases 
fall into this category, zoonotic diseases. And that's in the strict sense, in the strict sense, meaning that these diseases have passed from non-human animals into humans in the relatively recent past, or they continue to cross over from non-human animals into humans. That's 70% of human infectious diseases. And the other 30% of human infectious diseases, because we are a relatively young species, just 200,000, 300,000 years of human history, the other 30% um, ultimately come from other creatures also. For instance, uh, viruses such as measles and polio and smallpox that are not zoonotic in the narrow sense. They don't currently pass back and forth between non-human animals and humans. In the deeper past, those viruses are descended from uh, and divergent from viruses that were animal viruses. So zoonosis, we live constantly with the situation of zoonotic diseases. The second word I want to define is spillover. This is the title of my book, um, and it was the title because it's so important. Spillover is the moment when this zoonotic infection passes from its animal, its traditional animal host to its first human host, that moment when it passes into patient zero, that is the moment of spillover. And it's significant that scientists use that word spillover uh, rather than climb over or jump over or leap over because it reflects the fact that this is essentially a passive activity on the part of the virus. Viruses, as I said, are very simple creatures. They can't walk, they can't run, they can't swim, they can't fly they ride. They ride in the hosts that they infect. And when there is an occasion, they may spill over from one kind of host into another. When they spill over into a new kind of host, essentially it's as though a species, a, a population of birds or some other creatures uh, has colonized a new island, a new island of habitat. Birds might be blown offshore to an, an island that contains uh, no species like them. For instance, an island that's without pigeons. A few pigeons might be blown offshore, land on this island. And if they find that there's fruit there that they can eat and that the climate is congenial to them and that they can build nests, lay eggs, hatch the eggs and rear chicks, little, little pigeons, then they can establish on that island. With viruses, it's the same. When they spill over into a new habitat, if it turns out that the habitat is hospitable to them, if they find that there are cells in this new creature to which they can attach themselves, into which they can enter, inserting their genetic material, within which they can replicate themselves, then they have colonized a new island, a new kind of habitat. And that's what begins with the moment of spillover, with that virus passing in to the first human. Third word, reservoir. The reservoir. The reservoir is the host creature or the host population in which the virus lives. Sometimes scientists use the term reservoir host. What they mean by that is uh, in connection with viruses that are significant to humans, the reservoir host is the kind of animal, the population of animals, the species or subspecies of animals in which this virus lives over the long term, inconspicuously, without causing symptoms. Sometimes the virus lives in that particular kind of creature at low concentrations. It replicates slowly. It's sort of semi-dormant. Um, it is not a raging inflammation, a critical infection. It is merely a resident within that reservoir host, within that reservoir. Um, and it can stay there forever. Uh, reservoir uh, hosts have contained their viruses in some cases for millions of years, and they have evolved to this accommodation so that the, the virus 
the virus remains in the reservoir because it is a secure habitat um, over the long term and it is a less adventuresome existence for the virus. But then if there is a spillover and the virus passes into a new kind of host, for instance, a human host and finds that it can replicate, then the virus enters uh, a more, may enter a more aggressive phase of its life history. And the thing to remember with viruses is that uh, they don't seek us out. They don't wish us harm. They merely respond to and obey what I think of as the Darwinian imperatives, the three imperatives of Darwinian evolution by natural selection. And those imperatives are first, replicate yourself as abundantly as possible, have as many children as possible, produce offspring as, as copiously as you can. Second, uh, extend, expand your offspring in geographical space, spread out, colonize new habitat, go forth and populate the world if you can. Uh, reach as many different geographical areas as you can. That's another Darwinian imperative. And finally, extend yourself in time. Avoid extinction, perpetuate yourself. Those are the Darwinian imperatives. Multiply as abundantly as possible, expand yourself in geographical space, extend yourself in time. If you do the first two, reproduce abundantly and extend yourself in geographical space, then you will avoid extinction and you will persist throughout time and accomplish the third Darwinian imperative. So there we are. And, um, and there have been a drumbeat of these spillovers of new viruses in particular passing into humans over the past 60 years. I talk about uh, a number of these in the book. Um, Machupo virus, 1961, spilling over from rodents into humans in villages in Bolivia, causing what became known as Bolivian hemorrhagic fever, a very, very lethal disease. 1967, Marburg virus, which is related to Ebola virus, belongs to the same family of filoviruses. Marburg virus coming out of Uganda in the bodies of monkeys that were shipped to Germany for medical research purposes. And in a laboratory in the German city of Marburg, this virus came out of the monkeys and infected laboratory workers uh, and killed a number of them, a very lethal virus, Marburg 67. And then 1976, Ebola appeared for the first time that we know of, both in Southern Sudan and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The first, the first recorded Ebola outbreak was 1976. And then 1981, we recognized HIV. We recognized the AIDS phenomenon, first in a couple of cities in the United States here. Um, and then a virus was identified uh, was given the name HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, and, uh, and was then found to be affecting people all over the world. The real beginning of HIV um, goes back a little farther and is a little more complicated. I'll loop, loop back to that in a minute. Um, but 1981, and then you had the, the drumbeat continuing, uh, 1993, uh, uh, hantavirus outbreak in the southwestern United States, 1994, Hendra virus in Australia, spilling over from giant fruit bats, getting into horses, and then after causing terrible disease in the horses, spilling onward to humans who are trying to take care of those horses, infecting, first of all, just two men and killing one of them. Uh, two men who were trying to save racehorses in a stable in Australia. Hendra, 1994. Nipah virus, 1998, spilling over in Malaysia, also from bats. Uh, before that, uh, there was a, an outbreak of avian influenza, 1997, in Hong Kong. 2002 and 2003, the original SARS virus coming out of southern China, spreading by airplane to uh, major cities around the world, to Bangkok, to Beijing, to Singapore and Toronto. 
infecting 8,000 people, killing 800, one in 10, much more uh, lethal, higher case fatality rate than our current SARS virus. And onward it goes to, uh, to MERS on the Arabian Peninsula, 2012, Zika virus, 2015, finally up to 2019. And we have the COVID-19 virus. So this drumbeat is a reminder to us that this has been happening with increasing frequency. Why? Why does it happen? What drives this phenomenon? Uh, I mentioned contact, contact between humans and wild animals, in particular disruptive contact. Disruptive contact between humans and wild animals gives viruses the opportunity to spill over into humans. And that's the fourth word that I want to focus here on, opportunity. The viruses are capable of seizing opportunity. Um, they, as I said, they don't climb into us, they spill into us. But when a virus passes from its reservoir into its first human victim, there is an opportunity. And if it can seize that opportunity, if it can replicate in humans, then it spreads onward and has a chance of enjoying um, considerable um, Darwinian success. Now, there are now 8 million, excuse me, 8 billion of us humans on this planet. That's four times the number of humans that existed back at the time of the 1918 influenza. Two billion people then, eight billion people now. Uh, our hungers have increased, our consumption has increased, our demand on the natural world has increased, the circumstances in which we go into wild ecosystems and disrupt them in contact and come in contact with wild animals, those have all increased. So there is, is this increased pressure. And that's one of the things that's driving this increase in, um, in, uh, in spillovers. Um, it's important to remember that all of the decisions that we make as individuals and as societies, um, what we eat, the other things that we consume, things that we buy, the consumer goods that we purchase, what we wear, um, how much fossil fuel we burn, how much we travel, how many children we have, if we have children. All of these things contribute to our individual footprint and the collective footprint of humanity on the natural world, the rest of the natural world. And by doing those things, by consuming products and components from the natural world, we are drawing these viruses that live in those creatures to us. We are pulling them toward us and giving them the opportunity to spill into humans uh, and, and cause trouble. Uh, some people say in connection with uh, this latest outbreak, we've heard that it might have come from bats in Southern China, COVID-19. And people say, well, uh, that's because Chinese people, some of them want to eat bats and bats are shipped to wet markets and uh, that provides the opportunity. Uh, but I don't eat bats, so it's not my responsibility. And I like to remind people that there's enough of this responsibility to go around. We all have bear a share of the responsibility. For instance, if you have a cell phone or if you have a laptop computer, then you are a customer for a mineral called coltan, which is used to make tantalum capacitors, which are absolutely necessary for these sorts of uh, high uh, complexity um, consumer electronics, coltan. Where does coltan come from? It comes from just a few places around the world. And one of those is the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo, where coltan is mined in wild areas of diverse forest, even in certain protected areas, national parks, national forests, and at the edge of them, such as Kahuzi Biega National Park in Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo. And who mines the coltan? The coltan is mined by hardworking men and women who go in there and pull this mineral, the ore from the earth with their hands and with, um, with simple implements. What do those people eat? Well, they need protein. Can they go to a supermarket? No. Can they buy a package of chicken wrapped in cellophane? No. They eat wild animals. 
if there's nothing else, they have no other choice. Uh, it might be rodents, it might be primates, monkeys, it might be porcupines, it might be bats. And so by being a customer for this sort of thing, for a cell phone, each of us is commissioning those people to go into those places and mine coltan for us and expose themselves through the need for having protein to the viruses that those wild animals carry. There's enough responsibility to go around. I'm gonna bounce backward to the case of HIV because I said I was gonna tell some stories as well as defining words and, uh, and look into that a little bit. This is something again that I cover in my book, Spillover, the ecological origins of the AIDS pandemic because it is very instructive about just how vast the implications of a single spillover can be. Um, we now know that the AIDS pandemic did not begin in 1981 in New York, in San Francisco. Um, the virus was not new to humans at that point. We now know, thanks to very good molecular uh, research done by a, a couple of scientific teams, including a team led by a German-American woman named Beatrice Hahn and by a Canadian fellow named Michael Warraby, we now know that the initial spillover of the progenitor virus of HIV-1 group M, HIV-1 group M, which is the pandemic strain, the strain that has spread across the world and caused most of the AIDS around the world. That viral spillover occurred between a single chimpanzee and a single human in the Southeastern corner of Cameroon in Central Africa back around 1908, give or take a margin of error. Now this is a very different story from what most people think they know about the beginnings of the AIDS pandemic. But it's, it's determinable through, um, through the molecular phylogenetics of the progenitor virus and the virus as it exists in humans. The progenitor virus is something that is now called SIV chimp, simian immunodeficiency chimpanzee. And that is the virus, particularly as it is seen even today in chimpanzees in southeastern Cameroon, that is the virus that is the immediate precursor, the progenitor for the strain HIV-1 group M that has spread around the world, killing at latest count, I believe it's 37 or 38 million people. And another 35 million people roughly are living with the virus today all began with one spillover from a single chimp into a single human. Now, how did that happen? Well, Beatrice Hahn and others speculate uh, that it occurred by way of what they call the cut hunter hypothesis. There was a hunter, inferentially, presumptively. There was a hunter seeking food in Southeastern Cameroon back around 1908, who captured, trapped, snared, and killed a chimpanzee and got blood to blood contact. This hunter may have had a cut on his or her hand or arm or may have, uh, may have gotten cut in the course of fighting with the chimp or butchering the chimp and got chimpanzee blood into that cut. That's the cut hunter hypothesis. That person was the real patient zero of the AIDS pandemic. And then the virus found that it could replicate in humans, but not rampantly, and that it could spread, but not prodigiously from one human to another. And that it caused eventually immunodeficiency and it could kill a person if it had time. But the people who lived in the villages of Southeastern Cameroon in 1908 had very difficult lives. They were dying of malaria and other diseases. Um, they were living physically demanding lives. They were suffering accidents. And it may not have been noticed that people were also suffering immunocompromise. Uh, you have to live long enough to die of AIDS in order for anyone to recognize that you have died of AIDS. If you die of something else in the meantime, nobody recognizes. So for 
for decades, this virus moved slowly from one person to another from southeastern Cameroon, and I have retraced this path um, down, probably down the little Ngoko River to the Sangha River, down the Sangha River to the main stem Congo River, and then to the what were then the major cities on the lower Congo River, um, Brazzaville in what then was French Congo, now is the Republic of Congo, and Leopoldville, which was the capital of what then was the colonial um, Belgian Congo, and is now uh, Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The virus got to those cities, there was more concentration, there were different sexual mores, there was also injection of, of, um, of medicine for various kinds of um, diseases, including malaria, hypodermic injection, and reuse of syringes, because syringes in those days were precision medical instruments made of glass and steel, and they weren't thrown away, they were rinsed perhaps rinsed um, in alcohol, perhaps not rinsed in alcohol at all, and reused. And so this combination of things, concentrated population, difference in sexual mores, and um, an injection of medicine with reused hypodermic syringes, those factors seem to have then boosted the, um, the transmission of this virus, HIV-1, and it eventually passed from from uh, Leopoldville, uh, as it became Kinshasa, to, uh, to Haiti, when Haitians returning from the Congo brought the virus with them, from Haiti to uh, parts of the United States and onward to the world. That is what we now believe, based on the scientific evidence, is how the AIDS pandemic began. It's worth remembering, one spillover of a single virus from a single population of virus from a, one chimpanzee into one human has resulted in that, that vast pandemic tragedy. Um, now, um, that first event was a spillover. And if a spillover takes hold as that one did and causes a cluster of cases, then we call that an outbreak, and that's the fifth of the words that I think are the, are the sort of pillars of understanding this. Zoonosis, spillover, reservoir, opportunity, outbreak. If the virus passes from its first human victim into another and in another, and it causes disease among a dozen or two dozen or three dozen people in some remote, remote corner of, of Africa or North America or Asia, we call that an outbreak. If the outbreak spreads, if the virus is highly transmissible and the outbreak spreads across a country, uh, that's an epide epidemic. And if it gets to the airports and passes uh, with people flying to other cities in other countries on other continents, then that's a pandemic, which is what we have now. Uh, sometimes, a spillover of a very dangerous new virus might cause an outbreak, but no epidemic, no pandemic. For instance, another story. I mentioned 1998, the Nipah virus spilled over in Malaysia. How did that happen? Again, it was a matter of um, human-caused changes in the natural world, disruption of habitat contact with wild animals. Sometimes it can be intricate and indirect. Here's what happened with Nipah virus. Northern Malaysia had been very heavily forested. There were giant fruit bats that lived in those forests. They were feeding on wild fruits. Much of the forest was cleared uh, and agriculture came to Northern Malaysia, including large pig farms, massive piggeries, operations where a thousand or 2000 pigs were kept together in a corral. The bats seeking food once their forest had been partly destroyed, um, ranged wider and wider. And on the pig farms, the, um, the piggery operators had planted fruit trees, plant, planted mango trees and star fruit trees and other um, income generating fruit trees in the vicinity of the piggeries, in some cases, even shading over the piggeries. The bats came looking for fruit. They found it there. 
in the uh, in the domestic fruit on these on these pig farms. They they ate the fruit. They sucked out the the juice, which is what fruit bats do. They dropped the pulp. They dropped feces. They dropped urine, and in doing that, they dropped viruses into the piggeries. The pigs were eating everything that fell. They picked up the viruses. The virus spread from one pig to another, a very, um, uh, uh, very quickly, very effectively affected pig farms all over Northern Malaysia. Some people said you can hear the, uh, the, the disease coming as the one mile coughing bark of the pigs as they suffered respiratory distress. And then the virus got into pig farmers and uh, pork sellers, pig butchers, um, and was recognized finally as a new virus. Um, partly it was recognized as a new virus because it had a strange pattern of affecting people. It affected mostly Chinese, ethnic Chinese people who were living in Northern Malaysia um, because Malaysian Muslims we're not eating pork, we're not raising pork. That was something that was part of the, the Chinese um, immigrant community there. So that pattern helped people, scientists, disease detectives discover that this was a new virus. They isolated the virus. They named it Nipah virus after a village where the first um, patient whose virus had been isolated um, uh, had come from, um, Sungai Nipah, a village in Malaysia. And that became Nipah virus. Now Nipah virus is very serious and can spread from one human to another, but does not spread from human to human as readily as some other viruses. And so the outbreak of, uh, of Nipah virus disease in Northern Malaysia did not spread, did not become a, an epidemic across the country, did not become a global pandemic. I know that you have had some outbreaks also of Nipah virus in some of the states of Eastern India. But again, it has not become an epidemic in India. Um, there has been some in Bangladesh. Uh, there have been cases. It has not become an epidemic in Bangladesh because the Nipah virus is not as transmissible as some other viruses, fortunately. Otherwise, it would be a very dangerous virus for all of us. Now that brings us to the third story that I wanna tell, you already know this story, parts of it very well, it's the story of COVID-19. What do we know about the beginnings of this, the origins of this virus? First of all, the, the virus that causes COVID-19, as I'm sure you know, is called SARS-CoV-2. It's the second SARS virus in the coronavirus family, um, the first having been that that virus, the original SARS in 2003. So this is SARS-2. It is a coronavirus. Coronaviruses belong to a group of viruses um, that have not DNA, but RNA as the form of genetic molecule in their genomes. RNA in these viruses is a single strand. It's more unstable than the famous double helix of DNA. And so when it replicates itself, when it copies itself, it tends to make a lot of mistakes and those mistakes are generally not repaired. And therefore single-stranded RNA viruses tend to have much higher mutation rates than DNA viruses, which means that they can adapt more quickly. Viruses are always mutating. It's a truism to say that some virus is mutating, but um, when a virus mutates, it generates genetic variation, the raw material of evolution by natural selection. So the more mutation, the more variation, the more variation, the greater the prospect of speedy evolution and adaptation. The coronaviruses uh, are different from other single-stranded viruses. They have very long genomes. Their genomes run to about 30,000 letters of the genetic code. And so if they were replicating and they were mutating as much as these kinds of viruses generally do, they would be falling apart. They would having, be having so many mutations that the virus couldn't operate. As it turns out, coronaviruses have 
a proofreading mechanism so they can repair mutations. So they don't mutate as quickly as they otherwise would, but they still mutate enough to generate raw material for evolution. Now this virus we know is, um, is a new virus in humans and scientists in China have been working on the question of where it came from. In fact, there is a scientist named Zheng Li Shi who has been working on the coronaviruses ever since the first uh, SARS virus in 2003. She helped to identify that that virus came out of bats, came out of not fruit bats, but small insectivorous bats. And since then, she has been studying the coronaviruses that are found in bats in China, particularly in Southern China, uh, where there is a high diversity of bat populations. She has been finding viruses. She has been bringing samples back to her laboratory, sequencing the genomes and identifying these viruses. So it was through her work that had been done over the stretch of 17 years that scientists, when they saw the genome of this virus, the COVID-19 virus, they could say, aha, it's quite similar to a bat coronavirus that has already been identified. One that Zheng Li Shi found in Southern China five years ago. It is in fact 96% similar by its genome to that virus. And that's the basis on which people say this virus was originally a bat virus. There was a 96% match to a known virus that resides in bats in Southern China. Now that's not to say that's the same virus or even that that's the progenitor virus. No, because 96% similar is not that similar. It means that they are cousins. It means that the two populations of bats, each carrying coronaviruses have lived separately for 40 or 50 years. And from one of those populations, Zheng Li Shi has found a bat virus that is 96% similar to our coronavirus. But the coronavirus progenitor itself must have come from another population of bats that had evolved 4% difference over the course of 40 years. And we haven't yet found that population. So we can't say for sure that this virus came from a bat. It's overwhelmingly likely. It's a natural virus. Some people say, oh, it was engineered by the CIA or by the Chinese. No, it is a natural virus. The molecular evolutionary biologists who work on viruses, the best in the world have looked at this and said, this is not an engineered virus. This is a natural virus. If you were gonna engineer a virus, it wouldn't look anything like this. There are thousands of variations, thousands of mutations in this that would not have been and could not have been inserted in a laboratory. It's a natural virus. It has been created by Darwinian natural selection um, in bats of Southern China, but we still don't know. How did it get from its bat reservoir into its first human victim sometime perhaps in December of 2019 or even earlier, November, October of 2019? We don't know. That is one of the big abiding mysteries of this catastrophic pandemic. Um, somehow contact between a human and a bat occurred. It might've been human, a human capturing bats to send them to market in the city of Wuhan. It might have been simply a farmer going into a cave mining guano uh, bat feces and bringing that guano out to spread on his vegetable garden as fertilizer. And in the course of doing that, he might have inhaled some guano dust that contained the virus and become patient zero, become the first infected person in this pandemic. Passed it onward to other people, eventually to the city of Wuhan, where cases of atypical pneumonia started to be identified in the hospitals of the city of Wuhan in December of last year, and then finally, in early January, scientists, a team of Chinese scientists with one um, uh, Western collaborator based in Sydney, Australia, identified the virus, sequenced the genome, shared it with the world, and it took the name 
eventually took the name SARS-CoV-2 because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so here we are, um, a matter of zoonosis, spillover of new viruses from a reservoir. Once the opportunity occurred for that to happen, leading to an outbreak, which became an epidemic, which became a pandemic. There are things that we can do to prevent this happening again. And if you're curious about that, we can talk about that during the Q&A. But I'll stop there. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very, very much, uh, David. Um, I think uh, we have uh, some questions in the Q&A, but I think uh, since this question hasn't come up yet, and uh, because it's perhaps the most important one, it would uh, be wonderful if you'd address this question of what, what you think one should be uh, worrying about and doing to prevent uh, future pandemics. And I request uh, everyone who has questions to please put them in the chat box. We have about eight minutes for questions, so plenty of time. Okay. Uh, yes. Thank you, Bitu. Yes. What can we do to prevent these in the future? Well, first of all, that's one of the reasons that I talked about the stages, spillover, outbreak, epidemic, pandemic. Um, to prevent future spillovers or to decrease the frequency and the likelihood of spillovers, we need to think about our footprint. We need to think about our consumption. It's not just a matter of human population. It's human population multiplied by consumption. And as we all know, um, consumption is not evenly distributed. And sometimes um, small populations of people can be consuming much more than larger populations of people who are living on, on the edge of survival. So population times consumption. If we think about that and think about ways that we can um, reduce our consumption, reduce our waste and limit the growth of our population, then we can decrease the likelihood of frequent spillovers of new viruses from wild animals into humans. Obviously, that's a, a tremendously difficult task. That's the, the mission of sustainability. That's what you all are about. Um, so you know this perfectly well. Um, on the other end, um, once there, a spillover occurs and once it's been recognized as an, in an outbreak in a particular area, we can respond to that with, uh, with fast um, uh, surveillance uh, of outbreaks with, um, with response so that outbreaks do not become epidemics. How do we do that? Uh, we train people in field biology, in disease reconnaissance, in molecular biology. We build capacity in every nation on earth so that we can create a network, a global network of surveillance, viral outbreak surveillance and response so that when an outbreak occurs and 20 or 30 people are sick of, um, from some new exotic virus in a village in Africa, for instance, there are people, um, paramedical people, researchers, um, local people who have been trained to respond to infectious diseases who can be there um, taking samples. Samples can be um, genetically sequenced quickly. The sequences can be passed around the world. Responses can be prepared. Uh, platform vaccines can be adapted to the new virus. Platform diagnostic testing kits can be adapted to the new virus. And we can respond um, at the site of the outbreak and around the world to prevent the outbreak from turning into an epidemic or a pandemic. But that involves investment in capacity building, in, in training many more scientists in all countries, um, and in creating cooperative networks of information transfer and shared response. Because in, in this world, when a person is sick somewhere, um, there is a threat to everyone. All right, we have a lot of questions about, uh, about whether one can be optimistic. So one of those uh, is from uh, Vijay Kumar, who starts off by saying, thank you, Mr. Kwaman, for the lecture for your books. Why have we learned so little from the HIV experience? Are you more optimistic about the future in terms of our ability to learn and change our behavior? And he also asks, has any lab 
created virus ever kicked off an epidemic? Okay, several uh, interesting questions there. Has any lab created virus ever kicked off an epidemic? I think the answer is no, certainly none that I know of. Um, there have been lab leaks of natural wild viruses in a few cases, um, and they have infected some people and people have died. Uh, there have been needle stick injuries, uh, but um, none of those has ever led to a sizable outbreak or a pandemic. Um, why haven't we learned better from the, from the AIDS experience? Um, well, uh, that's, there are a lot of answers to that question, but one of, one of the answers why generally we haven't, we haven't learned and we, we weren't ready for this pandemic is that preparedness is expensive. It is expensive to create that network that I was talking about, to create those diagnostic platforms, to create that global response network. It costs money. It probably costs tens of billions of dollars, even hundreds of billions of dollars to create an effective global network of viral discovery, outbreak surveillance, and integrated response, expensive. But compared to COVID-19, which has been costing us trillions and trillions of dollars, it's cheap. Why didn't it happen? Um, one of the reasons is because national leaders uh, were averse to the risk of spending tens or hundreds of billions of dollars to prevent a pandemic that might or might not occur during their watch, during their term in office, between now and the next election. And I think that certainly is what happened in my country. My country was, we, we can all see that it was the worst prepared in the world. Uh, why was that? Well, we had bad national leadership um, over the last four years. Our president, I, I, I can't recall his name right now, but uh, uh, he eliminated some of the preparedness. Uh, there was a directorate at the National Security Council, which was closed down. There were other programs that had been put in place beginning with George W. Bush, continuing with Barack Obama, forms of preparedness that were closed down. We reduced our readiness over the past four years rather than increasing it. Why was that? Well, one of the reasons I'm sure was that it cost money and um, that administration did not wanna take the risk of spending money on a pandemic that might not have happened between then and the next election, but unfortunately, for that person, whatever his name was, um, it did happen between then and the next election. And um, for that reason, he's on, he's gone. He's on the trash heap of history. Um, and we hope he stays there, but we don't know. Um, so that's that's one answer. And, uh, and forgive me for getting a little bit political, but part of this is political. These are questions that are political. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, there are um, a few more questions which um, would deal with sort of which are which are political. So Nikhil's asked a question about Cynthia McKinney's subcommittee on hearings um, in the early 2000s on coltan mining, um, you know, and of course, the coltan business being related to the to Kagame's, you know, to the, the genocide um, uh, in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. I'm not sure how it uh, links uh, to your question, but um, but overall, uh, more questions about uh, you know uh, has he's added more questions about um, you know ways in which global policy is structured, what and how can that be you know uh, in what way can that be changed? Jeremy said he was optimistic, so am I. But how can knowledge and action systems be overhauled? Um, I am optimistic as well. Let me say that. All, all the things that I was describing were sort of negative and dire. I was, I was sketching the problem and not the solution. And I'm glad that Jeremy preceded me because he is much more um, wise and knowledgeable on the subject of, of, of policy and what can be done and must be done. So things can be done. Yes, we can be much better prepared. I believe that it is virtually inevitable that there will be more spillovers that threaten pandemics. I do not believe that it is inevitable that there will be more pandemics. I believe that that is within our control if we do these things. Um, how we do that is a matter for the policy people, um, people much wiser than I am about that. And, and I can't say too much more in specific beyond what I've already said. Mm -hmm. um, 
And the coltan mining that he mentioned is very interesting. I can't, I can't speak specifically about those hearings, but this has been on the radar screen for some time. And again, coltan mining involves, involves not just economics and not just ecological disruption, but politics and war as well. Yeah. Strategic resources. Yeah. Yeah, I remember Cynthia McKinney's subcommittee uh, hearings uh, at the time. Um, very sort of, uh, yeah, uh, sort of whistle blowing. Um, Nishant has also said, um, and perhaps this will have to be our last question uh, because uh, we're, uh, we'll need to move on. Uh, shall we expect a book on public literacy about viruses in the wake of COVID? Uh, given your generalist appetite, how do you see the stuff of sort of opportunities as well as challenges? Uh, a book for me, is that what? I guess. <laughs> there, there, will be, there will be hundreds of books on COVID. Um, they're already coming. But in answer to that, yes, uh, I have been asked by my publisher, Simon & Schuster, to set aside the book that I was working on last year at this time and to do a book on COVID-19. So um, I view this not as, a, as an opportunity, but as sort of as a responsibility um, to do my best to produce, um, to, to add a little bit of, of light, a little bit of uh, understanding, maybe a little bit of hope um, to the COVID picture. Uh, the challenge obviously for me is to write a book that will be somehow different, will be uniquely valuable amid a stampede of COVID books. And I, th I have a plan. I think I, I know what to do. I, uh, and I am interviewing uh, dozens of scientists from, from um, Tony Fauci to, and uh, Zheng Li Shi to graduate students in Edinburgh that people haven't heard of who are doing wonderful work on tracing the new variants. So I, I will be producing a book. Um, I hope by the end of this year, it'll be written, published perhaps sometime in next year, 2022. It will not be a sequel to Spillover. It will be a, a new book mm -hmm. and it will be focused probably mainly on the virus uh, and the evolution of the virus. I will be seeing this through, through the lens of evolutionary biology and how this virus has succeeded so well in becoming such a devastating um, visitor to the human population.